Hi, my name is Stephen Balaban. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lambda. And today I'm gonna to be walking you through how to build a GPU cluster from scratch for your machine learning team. Let's get started. A little bit of a background on Lambda. We are an AI infrastructure company and we provide GPU servers and clusters for companies in the Fortune 500, some of the top universities in the world, national labs in the United States, and the DoD. In addition to being the CEO, I'm also the lead architect of the Lambda Echelon, which is our turnkey GPU cluster product. And this talk is largely based on the Lambda Echelon reference design white paper and the experience we've gained in deploying these large clusters um, uh, for, for customers. So a quick little overview of the talk. I'm going to start off by going over some of the use cases that you're likely to see for, you know, your, that your machine learning team is doing. So, uh, and how some of those use cases can really change the design of the cluster. Then I'm going to kind of walk through the three levels of abstraction that you're going to be dealing with as you design the cluster. So that's cluster design, rack level design, node design. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how all of those different levels of abstraction sort of interact with each other. So we've all been here before, which is what I call the five stages of public cloud or GPU cloud grief. It starts off with the shock of an expensive cloud bill. So you get this email and you've got an extremely high public cloud bill. And you go and talk with your engineering or machine learning research team and you say, all right, let's try and bring this down. Let's uh, try out a few different uh, ways of doing that. And um, you know that's what we, we call stage one, which is denial, which is, oh, this won't happen again next month and we'll, 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 we'll fix it. Because next month, what happens is you get the same bill or the bill even continues to grow. And that's when you slip into stage two, which is anger. Then stage three is bargaining. Um, you might receive an email from your public cloud provider that says, hey, why don't you try out spot instances or reserved instances? And this doesn't end up really helping um, more, more likely than not, you just end up getting locked into paying a, a, an upfront fee and reserving the instance for a three-year period. So that's where you, you slip into stage four, which is depressing, which is that spot instances and reserved instances simply aren't enough despite having paid the upfront costs and it feels very hopeless. And you might just slip into stage five, which is acceptance. All right, well, I guess public cloud GPUs are expensive and you know managing hardware is too scary, so we're just gonna accept this. And the solution to all of this is to sit down and just learn how to build a GPU cluster. And so that's what this talk is about today. It's about teaching you how to get out of the five stages of GPU cloud grief and all the expenses related to that and how to build your own cluster. So there's a lot of really good reasons to consider building on-prem. You may already have an on-prem cluster, but if you have petabytes of data or just a huge data set, you can get really expensive egress costs in, in the public cloud. In addition to that, if you're storing your data on somebody else's hard drive, do you really own it? You know, and that's sort of this problem of data sovereignty and security. Is it safe to keep all of your data on what is essentially could be potentially a competitor's hard drive? And finally, at the end of the day, public cloud is just very expensive and you get more compute for less money by going on-prem. So the first thing that you're going to want to do before you start to build a cluster is to really deeply understand your machine learning team's use case. And 
that use case is going to drive the design of your cluster, both in the types of models that they're training, as well as what they're doing. So I'm going to go over three very common sort of model agnostic use cases in machine learning. Hyperparameter search, which is trying to find the best model. Large scale distributed training, which is quickly training a model once you kind of know the overall architecture of it. And production inference, which is once you've trained the model, deploying that at scale, usually to customers. So hyperparameter search is asking the question, which of these neural networks, in this case, A, B, and C, is going to perform the best? And by the best, what we mean by that is highest accuracy. So what happens is you assign a score to each of these networks by essentially training the network from scratch and then measuring its accuracy on an evaluation test. So you evaluate the network's accuracy and you assign it that score. Then you simply choose the network architecture, whether it's the number of nodes or types of layers, with the highest score. And usually when people are doing hyperparameter search, you know, it, it can take anywhere from a couple hours to 48 hours. So it could be a, a few days before you see results. And when you start off, you might start small, so training on a GPU laptop or on a single GPU. And eventually you're gonna to wanna to scale to faster GPUs where you'll do you know, A and then B and then C in sequence. And finally, you're gonna to wanna to scale that out to multiple servers to run the job simultaneously. As you can see here, running A, B, and C training jobs on three different machines is an embarrassingly parallel problem. You don't need to have any communication really between those three servers. And so the network bandwidth that you build in your cluster when you're designing it for a hyperparameter search application does not need to be as high bandwidth as other applications like large scale distributed training. So large scale distributed training is really, once you've found that model architecture that really works well for you, let's try and train this model as fast as possible. And so what you do there is you basically will take really large batch sizes and split them across a cluster of servers. And in general, you just basically linearly increase your learning rate as a function of the size of the batches that you're training on. And so you can get really amazing speed ups and we're talking, you know, training ImageNet in, in hours or minutes. Uh, as opposed to running it on a single GPU. However, with large scale distributed training, coordinating all these servers is hard. It's not easy to manage a cluster, deal with all of the, the, the network and design. And, and so, so that's something to really sort of note there is that when you're building a, a large scale distributed training cluster, you're gonna to wanna to design it so that it's it's easier for you to, to coordinate them and maintain it. In addition, as you can see, you know, when you have large scale distributed training jobs, they're basically doing the training and then passing the gradients to each other and then averaging those gradients before updating the model. And so there's actually a lot of node to node communication that occurs in the case of large scale distributed training. And so you're going to need to have a really high speed network fabric that's connecting all these nodes because the communication overhead is very high and you, you basically get a lot of chatter while that distributed training is going on. And so that's kind of how large scale distributed training can alter the structure of the cluster that you end up with. Moving on, the kind of final, also very common machine learning use case is production inference. So you can imagine something like talking into your phone, hey Lambda, translate hello into Mandarin Chinese. And it might respond ni hao and give you that result. Well, that's what inference is. It's once you've trained the model, sort of running it on new data that it's never seen before. Inference clusters really are designed for applications where you might have hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions of users in the other end of it 
and they're processing potentially you know thousands or tens of thousands of simultaneous requests. So uh, compared to large scale distributed training and hyperparameter search, you'll note that with production inference, there's an actual user at the other end of this waiting in real time for the result. And so the cluster needs to be high availability, high uptime, robust to any type of outages. And it needs to return the answer fast. But also, as you can see here, in general, you're basically running the same model on all these networks and the data is different, or excuse me, the same model on all these servers and the the data is is different and so there's not a lot of communication between the nodes so you don't need really high node to node bandwidth but you do need high redundancy and availability uptime and this little table here kind of summarizes how each of those three applications and use cases really changes some of the properties of your cluster so you know i just have written out here the node to node bandwidth for each of these three use cases, as well as the sort of redundancy requirements that you're gonna that you're gonna need in production. So with things like hyperparameter search and large scale distributed training, that's usually a queue based training job. So it's pulling training jobs off of a queue and you're coming back to examine the results later, whereas production inference is online, real-time responsiveness to an end user. And that really changes also your cluster's interface with the internet and how, how high speed and good that is. So going on to the actual cluster design aspect here, we really are working on three levels of abstraction throughout the design process. And we're jumping from cluster level thinking to rack level thinking, to node level thinking, back up into rack level thinking and cluster level thinking, and then all the software that ties that together. And these are the really the three levels of abstraction that you typically think at when you're designing a cluster. With cluster design, you're mostly thinking about data center floor plans, capacity planning, you know, how much computer are you gonna need, how much storage are you gonna need, what's the type of network you're gonna need, the network topologies to tie everything together. And it, you know, entire racks are just lines in the cluster bottom. As you go down to rack design, the, the main thing that you're gonna see are what's called rack elevations. And we'll, we'll go over what a rack elevation is and what they look like later in the talk, but they essentially describe the layout and positioning of the servers once you've physically built the nodes. And it's, it's, it's very important to get a very detailed rack elevation because that sort of drives the PDUs, the cabling, and really the set of rack elevations that you come up with is essentially the foundation of the entire cluster because you can really understand what that cluster is by just looking at the rack elevations. In a rack elevation, the node doesn't have any components in it that are visible. It's just sort of the, a name for the type of node that you've chosen. And then finally, as you get down to node design, we're talking about individual node bills of materials, which is just a list of the components. And sort of the node design is also very, you know, is really crucial because that's gonna, at the end of the day, result in what is the final performance of that cluster. And so that's where the node design is really important. The GPU choice, the CPU selection, all that stuff is at the node design level. And then finally, there's software, which is just how it all ties together. And it's really important to remember that there's software that runs at each of these different levels of abstraction. There's orchestration and cluster management software. There's the drivers and CUDA and PyTorch that run on the nodes. And then there's IPMI and 
some of the software you're going to be using to manage the uh, PDUs that run at the rack level. Each of these levels of abstraction really have some what we call work products. There's the full cluster bill of materials at the cluster level. There's the network topology, the data center floor plan. At the rack level, it's the rack elevations and rack bomb, and the node level, it's the node bomb. And you really need to create each one of these work products to fully define what your cluster is and for it to be able to be physically manufactured, racked, stacked, labeled, and cabled in the data center once it gets there. And for you to be really confident that you're not running over certain power and cooling limits that your data center may provide. Your data center is only going to be able to provide a finite amount of power and a finite amount of heat dissipation on a rack level basis. And you're going to need to make sure that all of these work products tell you that you're within spec and that you're not going to have any problems once everything's purchased and installed. So let's get into it. Cluster design. Cluster level architecture really boils down to these five components within the cluster that you need to scope out before you start diving into designing an exa a, a, a node, for example. You need to have compute nodes and that do the actual work and you need to define the compute capacity that you need. You need to work with your machine learning team and understand how much compute they need what are you know how fast it needs to be how fast it needs to talk with the storage you need to find your storage capacity to serve up data sets and to store the train models and checkpoints you need network fabrics for the compute to talk to each other for the compute to talk to the storage and for the management nodes to be able to copy data into the storage node or maybe to run a command on a, a remote compute node And you really need to talk with your data center in your, or your co-location facility and get a full data center floor plan for your, your data center, either rack cage or row of racks, and understand how much power is in each rack. What's the physical layout? Because you're going to need to use that for calculating cable lengths. And then finally, you're going to need to create the list of software packages that are installed on each node and decide on what software is going to orchestrate your entire cluster. So as you go through each of these things, you know, you're looking at you sitting down, like I said, with your machine learning team, asking them how much compute they need and really planning it out with them. With the storage, it's not uncommon for the storage to become a bottleneck for your cluster. And this is very problematic because this is bottlenecking mostly the, the most expensive part of the cluster, which is your compute. And so you really need to solve those storage bottlenecks so that you can fully utilize the compute that you've purchased. In general, there's two paths for storage. You can either build it or buy it. And so that's either working at the storage partner or rolling your own. And these are a few example storage architecture diagrams that you know you might put together throughout the storage design process. And these are pretty common, these, these three here. So I'm just going to quickly go over them. The, the simplest thing that you can do is really just have a single SSD or HDD NFS server with all of your compute nodes accessing that NFS mount and then using something like cache files D as a local NFS cache. And that's actually a very scalable and, well, it's not scalable, excuse me, but it's, it, it, it's a great MVP, you know, minimum viable product for a cluster. And you'll eventually, though, 
either run into bandwidth limits with the storage server, or if your data sets are bigger than the NVMe cache, you'll run into problems where everybody's just constantly having cache misses and going back to the storage server. And so you're gonna to need to scale that out to something like a parallel cluster file system. So that's stuff like Luster or BGFS. And there you're talking about a storage cluster that has a metadata server end that is a very fast, but can also be very difficult to manage storage solution. So you will want to have a dedicated storage engineer or at least a dedicated system administrator to run a parallel cluster file system for you if you're gonna be doing that. And then finally, for those that need, so actually with the parallel cluster file system, typically that's NVMe flash and that's stuff like Weka and like I said before, BGFS and Luster. And if, if you need a lot more data storage, so for example, if you're an autonomy company or you for whatever reason are storing tons of video and sensor data, you're gonna have really what is a tiered storage system. And you may have a parallel cluster file system as the hot tier, but um, you will really need to have HDDs as the backing store because when you're storing petabytes and petabytes, it gets really expensive to put that all in flash. And then you'll have a, an SSD or flash server in front of that HDD tier. And then finally, again, the local NVMe cache with cache files D, which is a, a great Linux utility that works across all of these. Another thing to note is there is this technology, it's called GP direct storage. And it allows your GPUs to directly access data from local NVMe drives without going through a double copy through the system RAM. And in order for this to work, you really need to make sure that you've got the right PCI topology. And we'll cover that a little bit more in the, the node design section when we get there. But this can, this can really speed up uh, your local NVMe read speeds as you ingest data into the GPU. And it's also very similar to GP Direct RDMA, which is actually for transferring data out the InfiniBand. So we'll, we'll talk about that later, but I just wanted to bring this up quickly. So again, I, I already went over a few of these. Uh, this is sort of the build versus buy, roll your own versus work with a storage partner type of thing here. And these are some common open source storage solutions. And then these are some common proprietary storage solutions that we see for machine learning workloads. Let's move on to cluster networking. So we've talked a little bit about sitting down with your machine learning team to scope out your compute and storage needs. You really need to then take that information that you've gathered from your machine learning team and build a network that, that can make it all happen. So let's go into some basics about networking. So with InfiniBand networking, you might have a switch. In this case, we're gonna be talking about the MSB7800. It's a 36 port switch. It's the 100 gigabit per second InfiniBand switch from Mellanox. We're gonna build some networks with this. So to start off, you might start small. And that's 36 ports let's say with four servers, with each of those servers having four 100 gigabit per second EDR HCAs. They're all connecting upwards. So you have a total of 16 InfiniBand cables. So 36 is greater than 16, so you're good. This could be a perfectly valid network topology for a small rack level cluster. However, as you expand the cluster, and maybe in this case, we're expanding to 12 nodes here, as you can see in that grid of three by four. Each of those servers has four InfiniBand NICs, remember. And so that's a total of 48 InfiniBand cables, which is greater than the 36 that is provided by the MSB7800. And so what you're gonna to need to do is build out this fat tree topology of you know, a spine and leaf setup where 
you're expanding out the network in a way that is non-blocking. So I'm going to be talking about building sort of one-to-one, -one, no oversubscription networks. And so what you need to do to guarantee that you're one-to-one -one is ensure that the number of sort of external or southbound ports is equal to the number of internal or northbound ports in this system. So the internal ones are the connections that you're seeing between the leaf and spine. And as you can see here, we've got the leaf A, B, and C each having 18 connections, nine to spine A and nine to spine B for each of them. So what do we have there? We've got 18 times three, which is 54 internal connections that are happening there. So we have 54 InfiniBand cables that need to be connected from each of the spines to each of the leaves. And you'll also note that each of the spines actually doesn't have the full, you know, they're not fully utilized. So there's actually some additional ports available. So this is actually what a fully utilized spine and leaf topology looks like in this setup. So you can see that there's spine A and B and then four leaf switches. So in total, you're going to have 72. So that's the number of cables in between the leaves and spine, 72 total internal connections uh, that are provided by the two spine switches. And that's equal to the number of southbound or external connections because again, 18 times four is 72, right? Because it's 18 times two is 36 times two is 72. So 18 times four is 72 external connections. And that is a way to expand out your network. And you can, you can expand this to either three tiers where you have additional sort of spines above, or you can do things where this is just fully expanded out horizontally. As you can see, that can get to the point where you have a lot of cabling to be done in between your leaves and your spines. And that's where director switches really come in. So in this case, we're kind of talking about the CS7520 series, which is a 216 port director switch from Mellanox for InfiniBand. And that uses a backplane instead of cables to build that internal network topology. So what you can see with this director switch actually is that it's got six spines and then six leaves. But you'll note that the leaves here actually have 36 external ports. And so what that means is if you were to open up one of those boxes, there's actually two of the same ICs, the two of the same integrated circuits that are put into the MSB 7800s in each of the director switch leaves, right? So that what that means is that there's 36 ports going southbound and then 36 ports going northbound into the back plane connecting into the six spines that are part of the director switch. And so this director switch provides 216 external ports. It is really important to note that as you're building the cluster, you do need to get the cabling done where you are spreading out each individual nodes cables across multiple ICs in that director switch in order to maximize the um the 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 node to node bandwidth it's it there's a little it's a little tricky to to set up so we're just going to go into a little bit of a, a node topology here so we've got this network topology for a single rack of servers it's got four different networks in it it's got a compute fabric a storage fabric an in-band management network, which is used to have the management server communicate with the storage and hyperplanes, and an out-of-band management network, which also connects the PDUs and other things, you know, sort of the IPMI system, the out-of-band management systems of these IT of these different nodes. And so this is an example of sort of a real-world network topology that you might see. Moving on 
to data center floor planning. You need to talk to your data center provider and your co-location provider. And you need to ask them, what racks are you guys providing? How much power are there? How much power is there, excuse me, in, you know, available to each rack? What's the maximum density that I'm allowed to go up to? You know, how high in terms of kilowatts can my rack go? And that has to do with the HVAC capabilities of your data center. And you need to pull that floor plan and all that information into some CAD software to measure out cable lengths. What's your cable run going to look like? And this is the sort of planning that you really need to do because not only do you need to know the cable lengths, but you, you really need to make sure that you're not busting your power budget that's provided to you by your data center. And finally, this is just a really quick overview of some of the software that we typically install and support on our Lambda Echelon clusters that we provide for customers. But you're gonna want something either, you know, on every one of these different little software sections. You're gonna want some experiment management software. You're gonna want some notebooks probably. You're gonna to wanna to have some way to orchestrate your containers. You're gonna to wanna to have a job scheduler. You're gonna to wanna to have a way to do logging of you know, monitoring and system health. And this is just a quick overview of some of the software that you might see when you're designing your cluster. Going into what is installed on the actual nodes for a little bit, at Lambda we've developed this thing called Lambda Stack. It's a it's a Debian PPA that keeps all of your NVIDIA drivers, CUDA, InfiniBand drivers, everything up to date, and also provides up to date versions of PyTorch and TensorFlow that are installed system wide, as well as a up to date version of Docker and the NVIDIA container toolkit that are used to run GPU accelerated containers that you might that you might write or you download from a container registry like NGC. If you use an NGC container, Lambda Stack provides all the Docker tools that you need to run that container. And what this does is sort of manage your upgrade paths for you. So no more if you switch from CUDA 8 to CUDA 9, for example, or 10 to 11 in this case presently, you typically have to update your driver and PyTorch and TensorFlow and maybe recompile things. Lambda Stack sort of just takes care of that all for you, so you don't have to run one command, sudo apt get update, sudo apt get upgrade. And you should check that out. We have more information available on Lambda Stack. It's uh, on that URL down there. So I'm gonna now dive into rack design. Rack design is sort of the, the part that ties together the, the little nodes and the big cluster. So this is an example of when I mentioned rack elevations before. This is an example of, an ra of, of, a, of a rack elevation. You can see this is actually one where we've mocked it up so it looks like what it would actually look like. However, the reality is that most rack elevations actually look like this when you're doing them in Excel or when you're first writing them out. And what it does is it shows the position of each node the name of the node, a little bit about the node in terms of what it does. But that's the level of abstraction that you're working at with a rack elevation. And it's really used for the person who's going to be racking, stacking, labeling, and cabling the servers into this rack. And in general, it's used as a way to understand what does the cluster look like at a high level. Each rack elevation really has its own rack level bill of materials. So you can see here that the, the node itself doesn't have its CPUs broken out, but it's just one line item in this rack bill of materials. And it's going to contain all the different cables, the PDUs. You're going to need to understand how many ports those PDUs use, and we're going to go into rack level power in just a little bit and the cables that are, that, are, that are gonna power everything. Probably the most important number 
that you're going to be dealing with at any point in time is TDP, which is thermal design power. But really, it's important to understand what your rack TDP is because that's going to be sort of a limit provided to you by your data center. You can't go over this level of this rack TDP. You know, you can't, the, the, P, the PDs that we're providing are X. And so that's why it's really important with your rack level bill of materials that you write out the thermal design power of all of the IT equipment that's going into that rack and sum it up and make sure that it is not going to exceed your limit. So let's do a little bit of a back to basics. How, how do you calculate power? You know, what, what, how does that work? You may remember sort of watts equals volts times amps. And that's true for single phase systems. It's definitely true. Um, however, it's not true for a three phase system. And so for a three phase system, you actually have three different lines and you are actually having if you're looking at the 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 um the voltage between those two lines it's actually going to be reduced by this factor of square root of three for for three phase systems because their their phases are offset and so you'll have the the ac phases that are looking like this and you need to you need to sort of reduce that voltage by a factor of square root of three you can do the math. There's some trig that you do in the phaser with the phasers uh, to to calculate that square root of three. But just trust me for now. And what happens is that square root of the three times because there's three different lines and the square root of three they kind of cancel out. And you know you will usually see this written as so because three over square root of three is square root of three. You'll see this written as square root of three times the voltage times the amperage times actually a derating factor so 0 0.8 it's a 20 percent d overhead um, that is a regulatory derating that the nec um, suggests that you do and so let's see how this works in real life how do pdu, PDU manufacturers calculate the power capacity well what they're going to do is take the maximum input current in this case 60, they're going to do the regulatory derating that I mentioned before. So they're going to bring that down to 48. And then they're going to multiply that by the, 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 the input voltage in the three phase system. So 208. And then you're going to multiply that by that square root of three, as mentioned before in the three phase system. And that's the, that's the result. So you'll, you'll get 17.3 kVA and that you can see that is the same load capacity that is provided on the data sheet. And so you can see that one, you need to do the regulatory derating and two, you, you really need to multiply those numbers by square root of three. But once you get a grasp there, you'll feel a lot more comfortable with building out these systems and understanding truly how much power your PDU can provide to you. Assuming that you've got a, a nicely balanced load across those three phases. So these are some common PDU input plugs that you might see hanging off the end of your PDU. For 208 systems, you'll always see this IEC 6309 if you're dealing with a 60 amp system. And that will be a red color if it's above, I believe 400 volts is the specification where it switches over to red. And for anything that's you know not not that's a, that's above 400, you're going to start to see red IEC 6309s, and then for 30 amp circuits, you're going to typically see this NEMA L1530P. There's a few other things you might see, but this is a very common one. It's a twist lock, and. Again, so it's, it's really important that you ask your data center, by the way, hey, what are the input receptacles that are being provided to me so that you make sure that your PD is going to be able to plug in at the end of the day? Then you're going to need to figure out what are all the receptacles that I have that need to be plugged into the PDU? What are the PDU receptacles that are available to me? 
and what are the cable lengths that I need to connect those servers into the PDUs. And these sort of pairs, you can see here, this IEC C13 plug plugs into the IEC C14 receptacle that you'll commonly see on a server. And then you usually have a cable that's an IEC C13 to C14 cable that plugs into the PDU receptacle and then into the server. And these sort of four pairs are the most common pairs that you'll see. As you move into IT equipment like the hyperplane servers with 16 GPUs in them, or a DGX2, or some of that director switch we talked about earlier, you'll see a movement from C13, C14s to C19, C20s, which support a higher amperage level than the C13, C14s. So now you really can understand how much work goes into this bill of materials. It's understanding the network, the cable lengths, the power, the entire cluster design. And you, there's a lot of work that goes into the rack level bill of materials. So we're going to go over a few different rack elevations now and talk a little bit about how you might want to design your rack elevation so that they're scalable. What we mean by scalable here is that you can build one rack and then expand to more without having to move around too many things. So in this case, this is a 40 GPU rack elevation. It can train mask RCNN on MS Coco in 25 minutes. It's got 40 GPUs. And you can see it's got that four network the four networks that we talked about earlier, the compute, the storage, the IPMI, and the in-band management network. As we expand that to more racks, you'll see that the design doesn't change too much. There's the same layout, same rack elevation, and then that way you can start with something that looks like the 40 GPU rack and expand it into this 160 GPU rack without having to move too many of the components in your original rack. And that's what we mean by having a scalable rack elevation. This rack elevation of four racks then sort of becomes the copy and pasteable unit of scale that we would use in a 800 GPU 21 rack cluster. So there's basically a total of five, five of these four rack rows in this cluster. And then there's this new core networking rack where all of the spine switches for this significantly larger network go. And this particular cluster of 800 GPUs can train ResNet 50 on ImageNet in a little over a minute, which is obviously an outstanding feat and you can just imagine how productive your machine learning team would be if they had access to that level of compute. So now we're going to go into node design. Node design is really the art of choosing a GPU, choosing a CPU, choosing a motherboard, and making sure they all work together. Depending on your application, you may want to choose a different type of GPU. For example, for large-scale distributed training, the A100s, in this case, this is photographed here, the PCIe version, but typically the SXM4s would be better. You might want to do large-scale distributed training with an A100. Whereas if you're doing hyperparameter search, something like the Quadro RTX 8000 might be a better choice because you get uh, sort of better flops per dollar on that. And so choosing the right GPU really depends on your use case. GPU benchmarking is extremely difficult to do. There's a lot of different parameters. There's questions like, well, if one GPU has more memory than the other, do I increase the batch size? Do I keep the batch size the same? Is that a fair comparison? And so there's a lot of thinking that goes into this. And there's two 
places that I would sort of recommend that you check out if you want to understand the performance of different GPUs and as you're trying to understand what's going to work for your team is looking on MLPerf and looking at some of the the networks that are being trained there and seeing which GPUs are performing best for, for your use case. And then also at Lambda, we run very extensive GPU benchmarks and publish those results on our blog. So here's a few things that you want to look for inside of your node and compute system when you're designing it. You're going to need to know the number of PCIe lanes, the PCIe topology, the generation of that PCI, PCIe. Um, for example, Gen 4 PCIe, 16 lanes of that will be 32 gigabytes per second data transfer. Whereas with Gen 3, it's only 16. So, um, so with Gen 4, 32 gigabytes of data transfer is twice as fast. And you'll know that's really important when, if you're dealing with 200 gigabit per second InfiniBand, well, 200 gigabits divided by eight is 25 gigabytes. 25 gigabytes is greater than 16 gigabytes, which is the maximum available bandwidth on 16 lanes of Gen 3. So you can't use Gen 3 with a 200 gigabit per second InfiniBand card. What will happen is that the, the card will just start throttling at the PCIe level, and you're not gonna reach your maximum bandwidth available to you. So it's really important that you understand that all of the components need to go through that PCIe bus and you need to make sure that they all work together. Finally, there are some little nuances with things like Newman node topology. So for example, on the AMD Epic, it's a chiplet design and there's there's sort of these different Newman nodes, non-uniform memory access nodes that really can affect GPU peering, virtualization, and it's important to understand the consequences of that if you're planning on doing virtualization. And then finally, you're gonna to wanna to design your node to maximize your flops per dollar at the end of the day. So we're gonna go in quickly into GPU peering and PCIe topologies. This is an example PCIe topology. You can look at PCI topologies by just pulling up the systems block diagram and we'll go into some real world system block diagrams shortly. But that will essentially show you what your PCI topology is. And that is basically your the map for your entire node in terms of what you can and cannot put into that system. The PLX here is a P PCIe switch. The NV link is obviously connecting one and two, GPU one and GPU three, and those are. It's an example topology. As you're examining different topologies, you, you see that there's there's going to start to be some different trade-offs. Largely speaking, the trade-offs that you're going to have are CPU to GPU bandwidth, north-south bandwidth, and GPU to GPU bandwidth, east-west bandwidth. So in this example, this is a dual root PCIe topology. There are a total of 16 times four. So 64 PCIe lanes connecting the CPUs down into the GPUs. So that's the maximum north-south bandwidth that you're gonna see. However, if, CP, if GPU zero is trying to communicate over to GPU seven, it needs to go up through that CPU to CPU interconnect, which can be slow and bottleneck, especially if you're having a bunch of data going like that and traveling from sort of one side to the other side simultaneously. And that can be a problem for training. Now, things like NVLink have fixed this, but not every server has NVLink. So that's where you'll start to see this single root PCIe topology, because in this case, if GPU zero wants to communicate to GPU seven, it only needs to go through the PCIe controller of the CPU zero and not over the CPU zero to CPU one interconnect. And so 
that's the advantage of a single root to PCIe topology. It's going to increase your GPU to GPU bandwidth. However, as you can see here, now there's only 32 PCIe lanes going from CPUs to GPUs. And so the data transfer is going to be a little bit constrained from the CPU to the GPU. Even more extreme is doing what's called a cascaded PCIe topology. And now that's where GPU zero can communicate to GPU seven, but instead of going through the CPU's PCIe controller, it's actually only passing through the PLX switches. And the PLX switches themselves are actually higher bandwidth, lower latency PCIe transfer, PCI switches than what's available in your CPU. And so this is an extreme example, but because you can see that now our CPU to GPU bandwidth is only 16 lanes. However, thankfully NVIDIA's come up with NVLink, which allows the GPUs to have their own little network fabric right on the board. Now, this example is the NVLink hybrid cube mesh topology from the Lambda, Lambda Hyperplane 8. And also this, this is similar to the DGX, the original DGX1. And you can see that there's this NVLink mesh. And what, um, what happens here is that the GPUs can communicate to each other over that NVLink mesh and then send the data out the InfiniBand NICs through the PCIe switches that they're all hooked up underneath. With the advent of the DGX2 and also the Lambda Hyperplane 8 A100 series, you've got this NV switch. And the NV switch is actually kind of a network fabric that looks quite similar in some sense to some of the network fabrics that we talked about earlier. And that's instead of having actual individual hardwired NV link lanes, you've got this NV switch that everything's connected up into. And with the new uh, Lambda Hyperplane 8 A100 or the DGX A100 server, you're going to have one InfiniBand NIC for every GPU. So those systems have actually eight outgoing InfiniBand connections that allow for extreme node-to-node -node bandwidth. What's worth noting is that Without technology like GP Direct RDMA over InfiniBand, you need to copy data from the GPU into the CPU memory, and the CPU copies it from its memory into the InfiniBand NIC out the door. With GP Direct RDMA, you can communicate directly through that PCI switch out the door, and this can dramatically improve your node to node bandwidth. And I've measured it personally where you can see improvements of up to 2x by enabling GPU Direct RDMA over InfiniBand. So let's go into some real life examples of PCIe topologies quickly. This is a Lambda scale where you can see it's got the um, these two AMD epics. This is a Lambda Hyperplane 8. It's got these two AMD epics and then the same sort of NV switched topology and a bunch of PCIe switches under that as a dual root topology. This is also a dual root topology because you can see that there's two CPUs that um, each have their own tree underneath them. And at the end of the day, as you're putting this all together, you're going to have to write your cluster, rack, node bills of materials, price out your bombs, negotiate a co-location contract, order all of the parts of your bombs, assembling the servers, you gotta ship the racks, you gotta rack stack label and cable, install the software, turn it on, and then maintain it for the life of the cluster. And that's a lot of work. And it usually requires an entire team of people to successfully execute on a cluster project like that. Alternatively, you can work with Lambda, and we can sit down with you and build a, a customized Echelon GPU cluster for you. And that could save you a lot of time. However, you know, I hope this was, uh, you know, and, and then, then you're done. Then you're done.
I, you know, I hope this was a, a really informative talk for you. I hope you've learned how to build a machine learning cluster and, and feel free to reach out to us at Lambda when you're, when you're looking to uh, go out and, and, and build that cluster. Just to close up, again, you can come and see us at NeurIPS or ICCV or CVPR. We publish research in those journals and attend those conferences, especially after COVID's over, we'll be back and you'll see our booth there. And um, please feel free to reach out to Lambda if you've got any questions. Feel free to reach out directly to me if you've got any questions. My my email is Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, at Lambda Labs, L-A-M-B-D-A-L-A-B-S.com. So Stephen at Lambda Labs.com. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have about designing a cluster for your team. And I'd be really excited to sit down and talk with you about it. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this presentation, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.